You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number 11. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm your host Katie Wardrobe, a music tech trainer, presenter and consultant from Melbourne, Australia. Today I thought I would actually share my own story, how I got where I am and I really do feel like this is a little bit self-indulgent but I do get asked the question a lot so I thought I'd share a bit about my history here. The most common questions that people ask me at events and workshops and things like that are, which school do I teach at and how did I end up doing what I'm doing and also what does my week look like, what are the sorts of things that I do every day. So I thought I'd cover that today and the first thing is I don't actually teach in a school. Uh, My sole focus is running professional development training for music teachers in the technology niche and that's done through my business Midnight Music which you probably have heard me mention on the podcast before if you've been listening to a few episodes. Now I thought I'd share how I I got here and got involved with technology in the first place because I actually didn't grow up you know surrounded by technology. I haven't done any type of technology related um, degree or formal training and I got here a little bit accidentally I suppose. I shared my tech journey in a keynote speech that I gave in 2015. I actually got to got to do that speech twice in the same year, which was really great at a couple of um, national conferences, one here in Australia and one in New Zealand. And I shared with those people my tech journey over the years. Now, I started off in the mid 80s. I'm going to totally give away my age here. <laughs> so the mid 80s uh, with a typing tutor program. And this was when I was just starting out with high school. So my technology experience at that time when I was about sort of 12 or 13 years old, old was with a typing tutor on a computer, uh, in which was in a computer lab at the school that I went to. Um, That was about the only experience of technology, I think, in that year. A little bit later, my dad went and bought a Commodore 64 computer. So we had that at home. And most of the time that was used to play games. It had a floppy disk, actual floppy disk, and a disk drive that uh, was, I think, blown up at one stage by my dad. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but I have vague memories of that. So that was pretty limited computer use and really for me it was, you know, all about games, using it for games. In the early 90s when I was at university, I did do a music education degree at Melbourne University here and I really did not use computers at all at that time. The extent of my technology use was using a typewriter for assignments and Um, Most of the students at the time, I mean, I think the majority of us were still handwriting assignments but doing a good copy on a typewriter, usually for me late at night, 3am in the morning or something, the day before it was due. And I do remember a few people using computers at the time, but it really wasn't everybody. It was just a handful at at that stage. After university, I tried a few other things. So even though I studied a music education degree at university, I decided that I would see what else was out there and felt that I could come back to teaching if I decided to, but would maybe try a few other things first. So I had a few different jobs, um, music retail. I worked in a, a music shop here in Melbourne. And at the time I was working in the sheet music department. So, you know, that was a good learning curve and a good experience dealing with people. I later worked in arts administration. So I was um, working for a professional orchestra here in Melbourne that plays for the opera and the ballet and doing sort of project management and running their education program there. My entry into technology and, you know, use of technology in those jobs was really like anybody else, I suppose, really out of necessity. And I used at uh, one small part-time job that I had, I, I used WordPerfect software. And at that stage, it had a, a blue or a black screen, I can't really remember. And I think maybe orange typing on the on the screen really difficult to use for a newcomer to technology because it wasn't 
a, a an interface which showed you what the end product was going to look like. So you had to know shortcuts, you know, how to, how to create bold text, for instance. You needed to use the shortcut for that. You couldn't just click on a, a B for bold button, which would make the next part of your text bold and so on. So the output didn't really resemble what you were doing on the screen. And I found that really frustrating and really hard work at the time. Later on, you know, Word came in with the, you know, what they call a what you see is what you get interface. So what you see on the screen looks like pretty much what you're going to print out in the end. And that was much, much easier to use. But still, I felt frustration and um, quite a lot of fear at the time because, you know, I, I didn't know much about it and I didn't have anyone training me. So I had to feel my way and work things out as, as I went along. Now, in addition to the sort of administration jobs I was doing at the time, I was also doing quite a bit of work as a copyist and arranger. And that was, you know, my passion at the time. I really, really enjoyed doing that work. And at school, when I was doing arrangements for school ensembles and choir groups and a cappella groups that I was in, I was handwriting everything at the time. And I got really good at type typing, uh, typesetting, I should say, music notation through um, doing a pencil version, first of all, and then doing a good copy over the top of the pencil version with a special fine liner that I bought. I had a little kit with a, a ruler and a razor and a 2B pencil and a specific fine liner that was the one that I really liked. And I got very good at spacing out music and making it look pretty good. And along came notation software. And that was really my motivation at the time for getting into technology. I thought, wow, this sounds awesome. You know, that the fact that you can actually type your music onto a screen and do things like, you know, delete it later on or move it around and copying and pasting, even though that sounds a bit shallow, <laughs> there's so much repetitive uh, material in music. So to be able to copy and paste made so much sense. You know, you can take a chorus that you've put in already and copy and paste it for the next time the chorus appears. And that just seemed um, that it should be a massive time-saving thing. So I went into a music shop and I asked, you know, what, what is this notation software? What do I need to buy? And the person at the time, I, I think they didn't really quite know what they should be selling me. And they sold me a copy of Logic. And this is in the very early days of Logic when it was, um, it was called Logic by eMagic. And it had a notation part to it. It was basically a sequencing program and it had notation as one of its features. But it really wasn't the right product because my, my um, specific thing was the notation aspect, not really the sequencing aspect at that time. And they probably should have sold me Finale, which had, you know, was around at the time and a number of people were using. And I do remember people using that at university. So I did have my copy of Logic and I, I made it work, even though it wasn't quite the right product. I did make it work for, for quite some time. Later on, I met a friend. Um, we became good friends, you know, and, and he worked at Sibelius. And so I started using Sibelius instead. And that in about 2002, I started with version two of Sibelius. And once again, it, it was, you know, a bit of a learning curve, but I could see some similar similarities between using Sibelius and using even just Word. You know, there were similar shortcuts and it kind of made a bit of sense to me. Still, a learning curve equals frustration, um, but although there was frustration, I could see the potential and also I did find though that the more I learnt, the more I realised I didn't know. So that, that can also be hard work, but I did stick at it and became, you know, really quite good at using Sibelius over time. The copying and arranging jobs that I was doing and I, I was also doing a bit of instrumental teaching and choir conducting and, you know, working some part-time jobs during the day. So a lot of the copying and arranging jobs I did ended up being done late at night. They're always done with a very short deadline and people often ring you up and say, I need this done by yesterday, which is hard. So um, often I was working really late at night and that's why I ended up with the name for my business, Midnight Music. There was two reasons and one was that I wanted a, a kind of a generic name at the time because I was doing so many different things. 
And because I was working late at night, that was one of the ones that I, I had down on a list of suggestions that I put together. So I called the bus- business Midnight Music and kept doing that work for, for some time. Later on, my friend at Sibelius actually said, why don't you come and work at Sibelius? So I thought that sounded like a fantastic idea. So I, d- I did take that offer up and I worked there part time for about two and a half years, which was fantastic. The focus there was education, which of course was right up my alley because everything I've done, even though I wasn't teaching in a formal teaching job at a school full time, everything I've done has been related in some way to education. So I really loved that. I got to talk about, you know, Sibelius and copying and arranging and typesetting and music notation on a daily basis. And I was doing that with educators most of the time. There were some other, you know, users as well who were professional musicians doing those sorts of jobs as well. But but largely it was education market. So that was really great. The bad thing, well, the bad and the good thing, it's, it's a double-sided thing, is that I was thrown into doing tech support for that job and I had to do that one or two days a week. And oh my gosh, kill me now. That's not a job that I would voluntarily take up again, but... It was so good for me. So again, I learned out of necessity and I had to make myself understand all of the problems that were going wrong, you know, with people and their computers. And that was a really great way to learn. It was a huge learning curve. And I had dreams that the questions people would be asking me would be along the lines of, you know, how do you create triplets in Sibelius or how do you do feathered beaming or something interesting like that from a notation point of view. But In reality, a lot of the questions were to do with how do I make my MIDI keyboard make a sound or how do I register the program? And the great thing was that it taught me a lot about both the the two main operating systems, you know, Windows and Macs and the differences between the two. And I became very fluent. You know, really, it is a language that you're learning. And I became very fluent in using both of those platforms. The other great thing was that uh, Sibelius had a number of other software programs which were part of their you know their sort of collection or or suite of products and that included things like Aurelia and Musician and Groovy Music and I got to learn all of those and present those so in addition to tech support the other part of the job was going to events and presenting at conferences and running workshops and that was the bit that I really really did like you know talking to people in in person and teaching them ways of using the program to make life easier. That was such a thrill being able to, you know, show people a few tips and uh, make sure that they got the most out of the program, but also, and in particular, speed up their use of the program. A lot of people would say, I love using music software and it didn't matter which program, Sibelius or any other music software program, but a lot of people, you know, found that they thought it should be saving them time, but it really wasn't. And I was able to show a few things. And then at the end of the workshop, people would say, well, that's fantastic. Now I now I get it and I'm going to go away and practice and you've saved me a whole stack of time. And, and that was such a great sort of instant gratification for me. My Sibelius job later ended. So I decided that, you know, I would try to continue to run training for music teachers in technology. And I did continue to do quite a few Sibelius workshops and the other suite of products that Sibelius had. But I thought, you know, I really needed to expand my own repertoire with other software programs. So I started to learn, you know, like um, Windows specific software like Acid Music Studio and some other things out there. And that was great because then I was able to run, you know, general music technology workshops for people. And I had a lot of fun doing that. I also discovered the world of overall education technology and through joining up Twitter in about 2009 and also starting to listen to podcasts, I I just had this whole world opened up to me of possibilities for technology in education. And it dawned on me that really a lot of the things that are done in other subject areas can easily be applied to music. So tools that other teachers were using for things like assessment purposes or, you know, what's now become digital portfolios and all sorts of other things could easily be applied to music. So I started to pick up information about that and learn more about those other types of things, which were general technology tools, not just music specific tools. 
The thing that was really good for me, um, you know, from a business point of view is that even if I was training in a non-music specific software tool or resource, the music teachers really wanted to hear from a musician. So I found that when I was talking to people, they were saying to me things like, you know, we've had a smart board training at our school, which is great, but they don't ever use any music um, examples when they're doing the training, a lot of uh, literacy or numeracy examples or history or geography, but they don't really know from a musician's point of view, you know, how, how it's going to apply in the music subject. So what I found was really useful was that I was able to translate, in inverted commas, the use of general technology tools for music educators specifically, because I had an understanding of the music curriculum, I was a qualified music teacher and I've done Kodai and ORF training and playing and singing and I've done conducting and playing in bands and orchestras myself. So it was a really good background to be able to pl- apply to the technology training that I was doing. I also found that lots and lots of teachers reported that they had such bad experiences trying to learn about technology. So they would have, you know, professional development for new tools or software, like I said before, from non-musicians or questions answered by perhaps an IT staff member at the school who was not necessarily a good teacher or a patient teacher. So a lot of the time music teachers are saying to me they had asked questions of someone else at the school, but they get a very curt or impatient reply, well, you just do it like this. And the person might grab the mouse out of their hand and go click, click, click. And it wasn't a great way for someone to learn how to actually do that themselves, to pick up the skills themselves. So I tried to make a big point out of simplifying everything in my workshops. I never assume any prior knowledge. So lots of people walk into my workshops and have a little side comment to me that they're a bit nervous about being there and they're not good with technology and you know they I think I think they feel they're the only one in the room who feels like that but I can guarantee to you that to you that pretty much everybody in the room feels that that way and there's a little bit of a nervous element to everybody being at that workshop and hopefully I hope by the end of it that you know, people find that it's not that difficult and not too hard and that I, I'm hoping that I've explained it in a way that they feel confident to go and have a try at whatever we've talked about that day. This episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast is brought to you by the Midnight Music Community. The Midnight Music Community is an online space for music teachers who'd like help using technology in their music lessons. There are online courses, video tutorials, lesson plans, music tech news and professional development certificates are provided for any training that you undertake. I'm inside the community every day, personally answering members' questions and sharing tips and ideas. The best thing is that you get to connect with hundreds of other music teachers just like you and share your own experiences and occasional music tech frustrations. For more information and a special joining price just for the listeners of this podcast, visit Midnight Music dot com dot au forward slash podcast offer that's midnightmusic.com.au dot au forward slash podcast offer now when i started running workshops and this was in 2009 in the early days um, some of the other workshops that were on offer here in melbourne were done in you know locations where there was a fancy computer lab set up with everything working and then you know teachers would say to me they'd go and do a workshop in places like this and then go back to their own school use their own gear and then have problems because they they hadn't seen the thing working in their own school or with their own laptop so i decided in that year in 2009 to um, live on the edge a little bit and try and run bring your own laptop workshops. Now, I mean, this is really common these days, but at the time it was quite unusual. So it really felt like living on the edge to me. I was running workshops on behalf of one of the the music education organisations here in Melbourne, and we decided to invite teachers from lots of different schools, whoever wanted to come, 
and they would all bring their own laptop to the workshop. Now, in those days, internet wasn't even an option because we didn't have internet available, you know, that people could log on to a network and join in there. So I had to make sure they had the right software ahead of time or, or access to different things ahead of the workshop itself. And even though it was quite difficult to do, they were really, really popular and people were so happy that they could see things working on their own laptop in the workshop they'd get back to school and most of the time it would work the way it did in the workshop. So that was a fantastic thing. Later on, iPads came along. Um, they, they started out, iPads came along in 2010 and it wasn't until a couple of years later that I started running workshops when they became quite common in schools. And again, that, that was fantastic because I could get people to bring their iPads along and we could all use them in a workshop. And it didn't mean, it meant, meant that I didn't need to find some sort of lab that was set up with lots of devices there. After a while of running those bring your own laptop workshops, I decided to add in some online workshops as well. And from a learning point of view, this made so much sense to me because there, there was a lot of people from the US who were starting to follow my website and look at my materials. And they would see that I'm running workshops in Australia. And, you know, by this stage, I, I was traveling around to the different states in Australia, which was great and got to see some of the country. And then I was getting all these inquiries from overseas about, you know, can I, it would be great if you can come over to the States or come over to Asia or come to Europe and, and do workshops like that here. And of course, I would love to be traveling around the world all the time, but, you know, with a, a family, that's quite hard to do. So I thought, well, online learning seems to be the perfect solution for this live online workshops of some sort. So I thought again that I would live on the edge and give online workshops a go and whew, these were really, you know, nerve wracking at times just getting all the technology side of things to work. There was um, a lot involved in that. I, I used online webinar software and basically told people a specific time that they needed to look out for a link in an email. They would get the email, click on the link and this was at a certain time, say 8pm on a Monday night. And basically they would get logged into the webinar software that I was using. And we would talk for, well, I would talk, it was just me talking for about an hour and a quarter on a specific topic. And people watching were able to ask questions by typing into a chat window. It really wasn't viable having people all talking in the workshop themselves, you know, actually sort of uh, phoning in to talk. That just would have been too difficult to manage and too messy for everyone else watching. So I got people to type in the chat window and that worked quite well. Uh, my own setup at home, uh, from just in case you're interested from a tech point of view, it was quite fiddly and I didn't have anyone helping me run the webinars or workshops at the time. There was no one there with me live running them as well. Um, that is the best way to do it if you can. If you can have someone else helping you, that's the ideal. But what I did was I had um, my Mac laptop plugged into a second monitor. So I had two screens showing. And basically on one of the screens, which was the one that was being projected to the webinar attendees, that was the one where I could see the main software program that I was showing. Now on the second screen, I would have the chat window open. So I could see that out of the corner of my eye, peripheral vision, if you like. And I could see when, you know, chat questions were being asked and every now and again, I'd stop and answer the questions verbally that had been asked, you know, by someone typing in and that worked quite well. Now, in addition to the two screens, I had a third one going <laughs> and basically had another laptop, which was signed into my own webinar as another person. So it was, it was signed in as an attendee. And the reason I did that was to have a recording, a place to make a recording, which wasn't the laptop that I was running the actual webinar on. Now, the reason for that is that um, it's kind of resource heavy to run the webinar in the first place. And I didn't want to risk the whole thing falling over by attempting to record the same thing on the same laptop at the same time. So the second laptop logged into the webinar was the place where I created the recording. And I would have to remember to press record on that one just as we were getting started. So I had a big list, a checklist of things to do before I actually started the webinar. And, you know, it worked okay. Again, it was quite nerve wracking each time I did it, but I, I got pretty good because I did a lot of those sessions. And, you know, as you know, you just get better as you practice. 
Now, the problems with running those live online webinars was that timing was difficult for a start. So my audience, people who visit my website and who, who look at my things each week, blog posts and, and so on, and who are on my newsletter list, are very much split between the States and Australia. And in fact, the visitors to my website, um, it's about 46, 47% from the United States. And even though I'm Australian, the Australian component from, of visitors to my website is about 18 to 20%. And the rest is made up of um, largely Canada and New Zealand, and then lots and lots of other countries in Europe and Asia and, and so on. So I do have a, a large US audience and the timing was a bit more difficult, of course, you know, timing a webinar which worked for teachers in the States and one that worked for Australian teachers too. My idea was to run these webinars in the evening and I called them PD in your PJs. So about eight o'clock in, in the evening for Australians. I had a number of US people um, joining in live, even though it was 3am for them or some other crazy time, which was I was so impressed with. <laughs> people would actually get up in the middle of the night and join in. Now, I, I did record all the sessions, so they didn't have an obligation to join in live, but they did do that. Um, they just wanted to have that live opportunity to ask questions and so on. So the timing was difficult. I mean, I could have run, you know, double the amount of webinars and done them all at different times. But the other issue with timing was that the time of year also wasn't great for everybody. So um, you probably are aware that in Australia and New Zealand, we are on a completely different school year timing wise to people in um, the States and in Europe. We basically go with the calendar year. So our school term starts at the beginning of February and we run right through to December, just before Christmas time is when we finish up. And then we have, you know, the rest of December and all of January is, is our summer holiday period. Now that's completely switched around from what happens in the States and in Europe. Um, most of those places start in around August or September and run through say to the end of May or June or so. So it, it can be really opposite times of the year. And so because of that, um, you know, at first I was running the webinars really with Australians in mind. And so I knew the pattern of the year. For instance, a lot of school concerts or big musical productions are done in our third term. Uh, which is, uh, say, September, October time. And that's nothing like that in the States and in Europe. You know, that's that's not that time of year for, for people who live there. So um, for me, timing everything to the Australian school year just didn't work for, for my audience generally. So, uh, and, and also, if you wanted to do the GarageBand webinar that I was running or course that I was running and you couldn't do it just in that month when it was running, then you had to wait pretty much another whole year again before I could do it um, a second time and run it again. So I really wanted to get past that. Um, the other thing was I wasn't really happy with the quality. So there were always internet difficulties, you know, on and off. I mean, not with every session, but there were enough to frustrate me. And I didn't want to have a bad quality product that I was giving to people. And the video and music playback. So if I pressed play, for instance, inside GarageBand to demonstrate something, the sound quality of that music that was coming through for the webinar attendees on the live webinar was really not good. And if I wanted to play a video, say a YouTube video or show film scoring, that was super difficult because videos just don't really play when you're doing it via an online live webinar. Not in that platform anyway. So I really wanted a better way to, to share this stuff with teachers and to open up the opportunities for other people to, to be involved with them. Now, while all this is going on, of course, my email inbox massively growing and I have had to, over the years, declare email bankruptcy a number of times. And email bankruptcy is when your email inbox gets so out of control that one day you just decide to delete everything and start again, which sounds really awful. I really didn't do that very much. I did it maybe once or twice, but you know, I had to do that because there was just so many, I couldn't get through them all. And mostly they're questions from teachers who just want help with technology. And my problem is I really want to help people. So I had a hard time just saying, look, I'm sorry, I don't have time to answer that. I really wanted to get back to people. And um, I've learnt a little bit over the years to 
be a bit more brief in my replies, but my early replies to people were very comprehensive. And, you know, I, you just can't do that with every email that you get. So it's just impossible to help everyone the way that I wanted to. So in the end, with the online, um, you know, recordings that I was doing, sort of courses and um, lesson materials and, and that sort of thing, and with all the questions, I decided that the solution was going to be to open up an online community where I could put everything. And this has been great. I mean, it's been a fantastic solution. It's not perfect. There's nothing that's ever perfect. But um, this is probably working the best as as good as it can for me and the people who are doing my course materials. So, so it's a great place uh, to for me to put all of my course materials. So, the the format of this is an online forum setup, and inside that forum is a place to ask questions and get answers, and also for me to put up all of my course materials. So that made a lot of sense. I opened that last year and. I can be in that community space every single day and answer all the questions that people are asking. And the best thing is that those questions and answers are saved there for future people. So if someone else comes in later on and um, they can browse through the questions that have been asked before or do a search. And the other great thing is that other teachers can join in and they can share their experience. It's not just me answering the questions or contributing to the conversation. So that's been a great solution and I think for both sides, I think it's a much, much better way. It uh, makes me feel less guilty about, you know, having no time to answer all the emails that I I have. People often ask, what does my week look like? And currently my basic pattern in in any given day on a weekday is that I get up early. I quite enjoy getting up early, so around quarter to six in the morning, 5.45, I do about an hour of work before my kids get up. I've got two boys who are in grade five and six this year and, you know, they get up around seven o'clock or so. So I do about an hour of work and that's great. I can knock off a few emails or answer some questions in my online community. And then the next part of the morning is really just, um, you know, being with them and getting them ready for school. And I do the school run. I drive them to their school, which is about, you know, 10 or 15 minutes in peak hour traffic. And then I, after I do that, I get back home and I spend the school hours really working on the business up until I need to pick them up in the afternoon. And that working day really consists of me answering queries in the community and adding new materials to the community, so new course materials. Um, I might spend some time talking to my assistant, Candice. She's um, fantastic. She's the one who handles most of my emails now. So that's been a massive improvement for me as well. I spend time creating course materials or recording podcast episodes like this one, uh, writing blog posts or getting on social media and answering queries there or posting things there. And I also spend time preparing for live workshops or conference presentations too. I don't spend that much time on that part of things anymore unless I'm running something brand new because over the years I've done so many workshops that I've got a lot of, you know, basically it's like learning repertoire. I've got a lot of repertoire to draw on so I can quickly run a workshop if I need to on most topics that I'm asked to do. My problem is that I get excited about new things, so I constantly think of new ideas for workshops and training materials that I'd really like to to do. At the moment, um, it's things like, you know, music and coding. I'd really like to do, you know, some training materials on that. Um, STEAM, you know, activities for music uh, teachers and just all sorts of things like that, you know, flipping the music classroom and digital portfolios and all of those things. Um, I get really excited about them and really want to get to the point of being able to share that knowledge or information. But I can only do so much. So I try to limit myself and prioritise what I'm going to do. So my typical week, uh, I, I have this year started theming my days. And because when you work for yourself, really, every day, can be all over the place unless you're very targeted with your time and I don't have a lot of time I've got you know this school day kind of time and I have to be very targeted there's always a lot to do and far more to do in a week than I could actually fit in so at the moment I'm doing vaguely it's not always this but most most of the time it's Monday is an administration day I, I do emails on that day I pay bills I 
uh, organize what I'm doing for the rest of the week. I try and work out priorities for things like podcast episodes and blog posts and I send a weekly email update to my community members. I try to prepare the stuff that I'm going to put into the newsletter which usually goes out on a Wednesday and Thursday and that's to everybody on my email list, not just uh, members of the community. So that that's my Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday I try to dedicate to content creation and this is really where I get stuck into creating course materials and podcasts and publishing blog posts and you know actually writing them and putting them together. I find I really need a long period of time for those. I can't just I can do some aspects of it squeezed onto another day, but I really need a few hours in a row, especially if I'm doing um, screencasting, so recording video tutorials. I need headspace and a lot of time to do those. Once I get that space in the day to do them, I can do them quite quickly and I'm quite productive, but I need that whole day. So Tuesdays and Wednesdays I try and use for those. Thursdays, um, I haven't quite managed this very much this year, but I'm trying to make that a promotional day. So a day where I, you know, get onto social media and um, maybe share things that I've done recently, um, maybe put together some Facebook advertising things and so on, and maybe contact other people that might want to work with me or um, podcast sponsors and that sort of thing. And then Friday is my backup day. Friday is a, a an unscheduled day for me to do anything that I haven't done earlier in the week that really urgently needs doing or finishing off. And I'm also doing, you know, some presenting as well. So a number of um, conference presentations are on Fridays too. I'm sort of pushing them onto that day. And there's a conference series I'm part of here in Australia, which happens to be all on a Friday. Each, um, each one of those events that we're running is on a Friday. So that's worked quite well with my schedule too. So weekends and evenings, I love to spend time with my boys. We do things like bike riding, uh, we play games, we go and see friends, we work on their homework together, we watch Smallville. (laughs) We've been watching the Smallville TV series, playing catch up on that. There are, I don't know if you remember, but there are 10 seasons of Smallville and we're finally up to season 10. Um, The joke was that in season one, that all three of us, me and the two boys and I, all decided that the theme song was kind of annoying and then we worked out that there was about 247 episodes still to go where we would hear the theme song and it's funny people when I say that to people they go can't you just fast forward through the theme song but it's not that long it's actually too difficult to just fast forward it without you know accidentally skipping half of the first scene so we just let it play through anyway we're nearly towards the end of that now so we'll have to find a new tv series next But we have a lot of fun. We have the occasional pyjama day as well. And uh, that's a day when if it's really raining and horrible outside on a weekend, we will all stay in our pyjamas for the whole day and, you know, have screen time and um, just chillax, as my boys say. Just wanted to finish off with saying, you know, my approach to technology is really that, yes, I, I find it difficult to learn new technology things too. And lots of teachers say that to me when I when I talk to them. I'm no different. I really do find it difficult to learn new things. And and that's mainly because it's scary. And, you know, I think, oh, well, I do it this old way, which I know how to do. And it's going to be quick for me just to do it that way, even though it's probably going to be better in the long run with the technology involved. You know, I, I have all of those thoughts as well. And I procrastinate a long time. You know, the thing that makes me learn a new software program is or, or some aspect of technology is usually because I've actually scheduled it into a workshop or a conference presentation. I actually choose things that I don't know. I propose things for conferences where, you know, I've never done them before and I just think that would be really good. (laughs) So, you know, that's my deadline often. I I have to learn it and I have to learn it well and to be able to impart the knowledge to other people in a sensible way by a certain date because I'm going to get up in front of a room of people to do it or run a course on it. And so that's always my deadline. Now, you know, if you're teaching in a class, you may not have that type of deadline in place. But I can just say that, you know, I try, I do try to remind myself that I know that it's going to be worth it in the long run in most cases, you know, when you're learning something new with technology. 
Motivation is the key, really. So for me, I try to remain motivated by thinking about how good it's going to be if I learn this new thing or what what fabulous things will it unlock for me, you know, or, or introduce me to new aspects or new areas of technology. Rather than procrastinating like I do sometimes, I think it's really good to set aside some time where you've got headspace to learn something new. And this goes for learning anything, not just technology related things. But, you know, you don't want to tackle learning a new software program if you've got a big concert or the musical production coming up or exam time. That would be silly. So make sure that you've got a time where you can get some headspace and just think, you know, clearly and calmly about it. And the other thing is that, you know, I found it easier over time. The more software programs I learn or the more technology tools and resources, I started to notice common elements between them all. You know, this comes down to things that appear in the file menu in Microsoft Word similar things appear in the file menu of other programs as well. And so you start to learn that, okay, well, if I'm looking for how to save, you know, the the document that I'm working on, probably you're going to go to file and then save. And that's true across all software programs. So I started to take note of those things across a lot of music software. And I'm actually going to do a whole episode about this. Across a lot of music software, um, digital audio workstations, there are so many common elements between all of the different software programs. And really, once you know one, you can kind of find your way through a new one, a different one, a second one, a third one, a fourth one. So try and take note of those things if you can. I find that that's a big help for me. Try and find a way to cut to the chase with learning something new. So, of course, I go to YouTube and Google first of all, and, you know, particularly YouTube is great for videos. Um, the, The slight problem there is that there's so much stuff. So I find it's really good to add the year, the current year into your search term, because with software particularly, things change so, so quickly over time. So if you search for a GarageBand tutorial um, in YouTube, you're going to get ones that someone's created last week, but you're only always also going to get something from, you know, three years ago or five years ago. And although sometimes they're okay and they might help you, uh, five years ago is probably not going to be so relevant to you now. So I find if you add the year in, that can sometimes narrow down the search choices and, and help you out a little bit. Asking other teachers, friends is a fantastic way of learning about something new. See if you can maybe trade off some knowledge. If you know something about one thing, you know, an app on your iPad or something useful and they know something about a different software program, maybe you can trade time and just walk each other through. It's really great. This is why people love coming to live workshops, you know, that I do because I'm sitting there walking them through. I'm showing my screen and talking through all the things. The other good thing about asking someone, particularly if they're a teacher, is that, and this is what I do in workshops, is that I mention things that possibly will go wrong along the way. So what I do is I practice every project that I'm suggesting in a workshop. I will do it from start to finish. And as I'm doing it, I go, oh, yeah, my natural natural reaction at this point in the project was to do this. And that makes it bad because, you know, X, Y, Z, bad thing happens. So then I know in a workshop to warn the teachers, don't click here, click here instead, because that result's going to give you a better a better a better result. So if you know what I mean? So when things go wrong for me personally, I know to then warn people ahead of time how to avoid those things that might go wrong with when when they're running it with students in class or, or doing it with other people. So asking other teachers is great. Joining Facebook groups as well. Um, There's a couple of Facebook groups I'm a part of, which are really useful. There is a big, um, Facebook group called Music Teachers and there's about well over 20,000 music teachers in there at the moment so great place to ask questions. There's also a smaller Facebook group called I Teach Music Technology I think that's the name. That one's a great place to ask questions which are technology specific as well. Um, You can join my community if you think that's the right solution for you. I'd love to have you there and help you. And again, that's a place where you can do any of my online courses, um, but you can also ask questions of me or of other teachers there. So my three top tips just generally for technology is to take small steps. That's the first thing. Just try one little thing, you know, just try technology in one part of a class or try one new app and 
hopefully that means you'll experience success and gain more confidence and then you can expand what you've done the next time around or just practice that a little bit first before you move on to anything else. Don't go and tackle massive projects first of all if you're not into that, if you haven't been doing that already. Film scoring, for instance, is a big project to tackle and, you know, quite involved with the technology side of things. But you could just choose one little aspect of that. And that might be to get students to search for sound effects that go with one scene. And you can even do that as a group. So a group project as opposed to sending kids off on on individual devices might be a better starting point if it's new to all of you. Second tip is to actually just get started. So don't overthink things too much. I mean, you know, as I mentioned, I do this myself sometimes. And the thing that I try and make myself do is just to start the first step. So for me, you know, if it's a brand new software program, I will just open up the software. That might be the first step. And once I do that first step, I will always do more. I will always go, okay, well, while I'm here with the software open, I may as well just click around and see what's in the menus. And that's a great way just to experience the software and see what's in there. You can see features when you look through menus and you just go, oh, yeah, that's interesting. You're not there to learn the contents of every menu and memorize them off by heart, just to have a little look around. So just getting started, do something small. Um, great, great places to, you know, build some confidence with technology and try things. And the last tip that I'll give you, and this is probably the most important thing, is to have a contingency plan. So we all know that things go wrong. In technology, you know, there's a few more chances for things to go wrong. The internet might fall over, the website might not load, the software may be unregistered when you open it up in the class even though it was registered perfectly well the day before all of those things go wrong they go wrong for me they go wrong for everybody at times it's not all the time that that happens it's really the minority of the time but the thing that I do and what gets me through all the workshops that I run is that I have a contingency and I don't think this through anymore. I can I can off the top of my head come up with an alternative, but in the early days, I would think through the contingency. Okay, I'm relying on the internet for this lesson, for this workshop, for this course. What will I do if the internet doesn't work? And my contingency in that case was that, okay, well, I can't get everybody in the room on the internet, but I could use my phone to get myself on the internet. Therefore, I can just show and tell what I was going to do with the class or the the group of teachers that I'm working with. Rather than them doing it hands-on, I'll just do a show and tell activity instead. And there's lots of things you can do like that, just having some sort of contingency. Um, You know, things, I think technology gets a bad rap because people think that things always go wrong all the time. But realistically, things go wrong with other stuff in music classes too. You know, the ukulele strings might not be tuned and you thought they were and now you're running out of time to to do that piece. Or I, I don't know, lots of things go wrong all the time. Maybe the instruments that you thought you were going to use, the classroom instruments, are being used by someone else in a class. So you will have a contingency worked out for that, whether you've foreplanned it or whether you just come up with it on the spot and technology is really no different so having a contingency is a great backup idea well I'm going to stop talking there I hope that was useful or interesting I do feel as I said before that it was really self-indulgent to talk all that through but because I get asked a lot I thought I may as well share the story and I can now point people to this podcast episode to have a listen uh, when they ask me in the future. So thank you so much for listening. I'll be back in the next episode uh, with some more tips and I'm going to talk in the next episode about free sheet music and where you can find it. So I hope you'll join in for that one. Please share the podcast around. I'd love to get more people listening to it. So you can uh, share the link to it if you're sitting at a laptop or just tell your friends. That would be fantastic. It's always a great help to get more people involved. And I will see you next time. 